Hi everyone and welcome uh, to my talk about leakage and metamodeling and its connection to HCC target encoding. And uh, my, my name is Matthias and um, basically some quick facts about myself. I'm born and raised in Berlin and still living in Berlin, so I'm working remotely for uh, H2O and I hold a diploma in computer science. Actually a degree it doesn't longer exist, it's now replaced by a master's. And yeah, working as a data scientist here and um, Basically, my focus is on developing driverless AI and makes this great product even better. And at the bottom, you can see my, well, if you want to, my roadmap to AI. So for me, every, everything began with chess. Uh, as, at a young age, my grandpa bought me a chess computer and was really fascinated about that device, how it was able to make that move. And I think I was like 12 years old. And I thought, okay, I want to do something like that. I want to know how does it work, uh, how can I program something like that. And so I um, decided to write a chess engine. And back then I thought programming is about typing ones and zeros in a text file and then some magic happens. And it turned out to be not the case. So it took me half a decade to get there. But finally I uh, programmed my uh, own chess engine and the time I played the first game against it, it was really, really deep level of satisfaction. And so everything just came around. So I studied computer science, that was um, um, bio-inspired uh, visual navigation of flying robots. And then I went into automotive industry, developing um, testing methods in Germany for Germany's PDI. It's a periodical technical inspections of cars where you have to bring your car every two years, and then I get, a, get approved for usage in the, in the public. And then I started actually Kaggling, which brought me here. I think I wouldn't be here without Kaggle. And I'm known as Farron, currently fifth in the world and holding a grandmaster title. So let's get started with the content of the talk. And um, first of all, I would like to talk about leakage in a general and I put here a definition from Kaggle, from the Kaggle wiki page, and that states, okay, data leakage is the creation of unexpected additional information in the training data, allowing a model and machine learning algorithm to make unrealistically good predictions. And what we can state is that there are many different sources of uh, leakage. One of the most annoying ones are ID leaks, so if our ID column holds some uh, predictive power and we can actually make predictions out of them better than random guess, guesses and actually that is not supposed to happen. Um, we can also make the mistake um, to take um, future information and um, um, use them to make predictions about the past. It's obviously m much more easier than the other way around. Or we do something like validating our models on already seen data, but in terms mean that we uh, leaked some validation data information into our training data, which is also bad. And in this talk, I mostly cover the topic of target information leakage, where our feature matrices uh, hold information about the target, which is obviously not supposed to be the case. And um, there's also another uh, really interesting topic and in all in the whole field of data science. And that is actually that we we data scientists, in some way, we are all little p-hackers because we do adaptive data analysis. So we test our hypotheses um, over and over again and take decisions where, and we have a feedback loop. And so we, we test something, maybe a set of parameters, and we change them, and then we decide, okay, do we want to keep that set of parameters? But we base those decisions based on outcomes on data which we reuse over and over again. And statistically, that's an invalid approach. You can't use, uh, do that, actually. Um, but we do that over and over again. And um, this for itself, if you think of driverless AI, um, we do that there as well. So you have to think about countermeasures in order to make um, really good models that um, generalize well. And another statement is that the cost damage varies from case to case. So sometimes leakage really leads to a total mess and everything gets un unusable, and sometimes it can even help. So it's really strange, but um, 
That's something you always have to keep in mind if you deal with um, predictive modeling or machine learning or data science. And another thing, um, if you now look at, that's uh, uh, our final solution in a competition called uh, HomeSite uh, that we won, uh, our team won, and uh, Marius, who will speak right after me, was part of this team. And if you build some complex solutions like that one, where we have really, really um, built a lot of models. So we built around 500 built mo uh, models, stacked them. We had uh, a lot of um, uh, pre-processing, feature selection, feature engineering, and leakage can occur everywhere. Leakage can occur during data collection, data pre-processing, during modeling, during validation, and you have really a lot of possible um, sources of mistakes. And um, the worst thing is that sometimes you are not aware of it. And if it's too late, if, it's, if the model is already deployed, everything can get really, really messy. Um, and one thing, if you, if you build uh, such stacked ensembles, um, um, then we call it metamodeling. And um, let's suppose we have a, a simple threefold split of our training data, in, um, and we call the folds ABC. And what we do is um, we create so-called out-of-fold predictions, and let's call them A2, B2, and C2. So it's like here. And we do this simple by uh, taking one model, like one XGB, and with a fixed set of parameters, and we train it on, on the data folds A and B, and then we predict C in order to get C2. So C2 is the predictions uh, of the data set C, if you want to, and we repeat that, and finally we get A, B, A2, B2, and C2, and we just say, okay, let's make it a bit shorter, so we say uh, A, B leads to uh, C2, which means we use data AB to train on it, and then we predicted the part C and get predictions for C2. And finally, what we can do is we can validate on this right-hand side here. So we can say, okay, um, let, let's take the labels of the data portion C and um, calculate our matrix uh, based on uh, the predictions for C, which is called C2, and then we can say, okay, our base model is that good in a cross-validated way. So, and if we now um, stack our models, we actually take just as predictions as a feature and do the same. So, we just use A and B to train on it, and then again we predict C, and then finally it simply becomes this. So, A2 and B2 is used to create predictions for C again, and we call it A2, B2 leads to C3. And the problem is, if you now take, okay, what is actually used to get to A2, we use for A2, B, and C. So we replace A2, we just substitute here, and see, okay, we have B, C. And B2 was actually created by using A, C. So we can substitute it here, and we see, okay, hmm, B, C, A, C leads to C3. What we see it outlined, uh, red line, is that we have C on both sides, so we have leakage because we have C target information on the left-hand side, which is not supposed to be there, and that's actually bad. So, and the interesting part is, even so, that that is the case, we often just deal with that and keep that this way and do nothing at all about it. Um, but it's actually something you have always keep in mind and take an eye on, you have always be, uh, because it depends on what you want to accomplish. So if you're interested in a true risk estimation of your generalization error, you can't actually do that because you get far too optimistic results. If you're just interested in getting the best model, then it can work, so it depends. But if you, you see, you have to keep an eye on it. And now let's uh, quickly jump to HCC target encoding. Um, and let's start with a general statement that tree-based models like XGBoost, LightGBM, or Random Forest um, struggle with such kind of features. So if you have a categorical feature with really high amount of uh, unique levels, um, then tree-based models um, do a pretty bad job with them because they, uh, in general, need too much splits 
um, to uh, partition the data into useful parts. And, um, but normally we have something like three depths of seven, it's a really common value, and simply not enough. And if you increase the depths, it uh, overfits too easily on your numeric features, et cetera. So we normally do something about something, we transform those features. And well, if you just map every uh, categorical level to an integer, then you have to choose from a lot of potential permutations to use, and there's the idea, okay, hmm, which one is better? Obviously, the order depends. Uh, the order is important because um, some orders make the life easier for the models, and some are really bad. And but there's the idea to replace the HTC values by their likelihoods to get a good order, and actually, that is a really powerful approach and works pretty well in practice. And here's just a quick example of what we can do. So um, what we see here is just a, a toy data set. So we have our X with two colors, blue and red, and our target is just binary, zero and one. And um, now we want to um, replace uh, our colors by actually likelihoods. So, but of course, we cannot use our target directly because it would involve leakage. So we do, again, a cross-validation, and uh, that's marked here, so one, two, first two lines are just fold A. And now we use the uh, fold, folds A and B to actually calculate the likelihoods for C. And that's uh, simply, okay, let's just take a quick example. So if you want to know, okay, what's the likelihood for seeing B, given data A and B, it's just, okay, we have three, three times blue in the first four rows, and one time it is one, so we have 0.33% likelihood of seeing blue. And now we repeat that for, for the other fold combinations and get a new feature called, um, let's call it X, L hold for likelihood, and CV for cross-validated. Everything looks fine. We uh, never used our validation target, so we are fine. No, we're actually not, because if you look Again, it's a leakage emitter modeling. What happens if, if we now use this feature again to retrain a train a model, actually that's what we want to do, um, we end up with the same problem here that we saw in, in stacking. So what we can say, if we use this feature XLOCV, we are, it's nothing else than out of fault predictions from a maximum like log estimator. And using that feature means it's pretty much the same as stacking. Essentially, it's like stacking. It's uh, technically the same. So it also has the same leakage issue. So we have, in this case, we really often have to deal with that because that fails in practice uh, very often because we have like no regularization at all. So what can we do about it? And basically, there are several countermeasures. That's not, that's just some of them. And but what we can do, we can just say, okay, we take a fixed holder set for all kinds of calculations like out of full predictions or likelihoods, which basically are really similar to each other. But the drawback is, okay, we have a lot of training data at later stages. Hmm. What can we also do is, yeah, we can say we use a fixed two-fold scheme because if we have only two folds, we don't have this overlapping, and so we don't have leakage in later stages. But that is not ideal regarding bias variance trade-off. So basically, most often, it's not always the case, but most often our bias rise is really high, and that's not good. And what we can do, we can do it uh, repeatedly. So we just not say we have not only one two-fold split, but several. So in parallel, not changing the seed within one pipeline, but we have several pipelines and average them at the end. That's possible, but it's... Um, um, just another, um, another way to deal with that. The third way is we can use uh, noise, so we can noisify our likelihoods or the full predictions, um, but there's a problem that it's really hard to get the noise level right. So if you think of um, the way how a um, tree model uh, works, we have splits, and um, if you have a really too good order with a split and we add too little noise, we're actually changing nothing. And if you had too much noise, we 
um, just turn our uh, feature into random noise, and that's also bad. And that's really a data set dependent, so it's really difficult to, to get the right amount of noise, and um, that's why it's not the best method. Um, the first one is actually um, nested cross validation. And um, this sets the drawbacks that it sets the complexity from linear to, uh, to quadratic. Um, but it actually works in practice best. So it's really, um, it gets rid of the leakage and, um, and it's really a powerful method. And we use it quite often in Kaggle competitions to gain an edge over um, other teams. And another point is what you see already that. Um, Sometimes um, you can't use that. Oh, let me go back. Sorry. Uh, sometimes you can't use that because it's too complex. It takes too long. So actually, everything is uh, usable, but um, you don't know what to use in advance. So you, um, it's really dependent on the problem. And um, with driverless AI, we we deal with all those things. So we try to figure out okay, what's the best way to deal with those kind of problems because. They can appear everywhere, and we, we do this complex pipeline of evaluating a lot of models and doing a lot of adaptive data analysis. So, but in, at the end, we want to have a valid model. We don't want that a customer or client or whatever, whoever uses the product actually um, finds that it does not work in practice. So we have to deal with a lot of things. And the idea of the last one of the uh, NASA cost validation is pretty much, OK, Let's see, that's the same uh, slide actually, like in the leakage meta modeling. So we have our, our normal cost validation where we use AB to create C2. And now we also additionally use symbol A to get B2 predictions and B to A2 predictions. So, and when we got that, what we can do is we can replace A2 now by B because we have an. Um, additional set of feature, especially for this case, which is not involving having C. And that's good, because now we have C no longer on the left-hand side of the equation, and we can just use it. We have no target leakage any law, uh, anymore. Yeah, that's basically it. That's the idea. So, um, but you see, you have this, this, uh, this nested cross-validation, because actually, within here, you have an additional Cost validation. You, it's just an example that you don't. You can actually uh, create new folds here because you end up never using C here. So whatever you do here, you can do if you do, uh, let's say, a five-fold validation on the outer level. You can do a ten-fold validation on the inner level. It's completely up to you, um, as long as you never use um, the right-hand side from the outer level. You are fine. And that's basically it. Thank you for your attention. And we have like 10 minutes for questions. OK, so it looks like a few questions have not come in yet. So I'll open it up to the audience if you guys have any uh, questions for Matthias. Yes, let me come over there and bring the mic to you. So, pretty random question, but do you still play chess? Um, yeah, I play chess, but I'm really bad at it. I'm really bad at it. But yeah, I do. But my ELO is like uh, one, one, one K 400, something like that. It's really bad. So, everyone can beat me in chess. Uh, I have a question. How did you come up with your, uh, your Kaggle name? Um, yeah, I'm a Kaggle name. So um, actually, it's from, um, from Lord of the Rings. And I uh, went to a bookstore, and there was a, like, like a book with uh, like a dictionary. And, and there, I just looked randomly into it, and there was a name, Ferran. And I said, oh, cool. That sounds cool somehow. And I, I just picked that. Because before that, I had even more embarrassing names. So I think it's improvement. Any other uh, questions from the audience? Checking online, looks like uh, still, still no Slido. Have, are, you, are you guys all familiar with Slido? Have you been using it all day? Yes, OK.
Oh, maybe I'm repeating okay. the first one. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I didn't actually get it. Uh, what exactly uh, out of this uh, approaches that you describe, I actually used in driverless product, or all of them? Actually, it's uh, some kind of the uh, similar to uh, to the noise injection, but in a in a way that uh, it does uh, better, uh, works better. It's but it's similar. So um, the problem is if you if you do this kind of uh, target encoding and you have features uh, with really low occurrences, um, then it's uh, then we merge them together so that you don't have like. Um, an unreliable estimate of the likelihood because your sample size is so small, so you um, say, okay, I know that that's a bad estimate for my likelihood, so I replace those values, because that's uh, the one you get overfitted uh, very, very easily. And um, we also do this, uh, this nested uh, cost validation. So I guess it answers uh, the first question, right? When is nested cross validation coming to H2O? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's already in, I would say. <coughs> that's the next question that's already answered. So when doing stacking, how do you split the data? Do each layer of the stack model have a different training set? Um, well, in general, if you, you, it depends, right? Let's say we have IAD data. So if, you, if it comes down to time series data, it's a different question. But let's say we do this normal stacking on IAD data. Um, then what we want to achieve is using always all data. So if you, uh, that, that's why I like those approaches where I can use the whole, full data set. So no fixed holdout, but always using every data point you have. And um, this is. Um, NASA cross validation stuff, and so you don't need to trade off data. You can just use every data point and at, at every level in the, in the stacking. And um, that's actually something I always go for. I always uh, prefer that because it just works better than leaving data out. Because if you, if you leave data out, it's pretty easy to overfit that sample, right? that, that holdout set, because it's smaller. So it's much more difficult to overfit your, um, your whole training data. But it still can, uh, can, uh, can happen because, um, especially due to this uh, repeated feedback loops, and many people uh, don't pay attention to that, it's actually a, time, a form of leakage because every decision we make is based on target information. So we validate and we look at labels, and then we, we don't change the data but we have some kind of meta level, meta layer of information storing all our decisions, and that leads to overfitting pretty easily. And um, that's why it's also this, uh, why there's this discussion of false discoveries in science because of this adaptive data and this uh, happening. Um, I think this is obvious, but I'll let you answer it. Does stacking beat unstacked data at prediction? Um, almost always. And do you have any examples where uh, this method that you described uh, improves your standings in a Kaggle competition? Well, the, the final solution at, uh, at uh, HomeSite included all those kind of tricks, I would say. Um, there's another competition we placed third. It's a BNP. It was pretty much uh, the same where those target encodings were pretty much the, the key to win. And um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really powerful method, actually. And especially because uh, tree-based models struggle with those kind of features, if not properly processed. And all those methods like one encoding, level encoding, um, do not really work that well. So you, uh, and if you know how to apply that, you, you gain a, a huge advantage. At least back in time, because nowadays it's pretty much uh, public knowledge. Uh, and there also were times where stacking was like the secret of Kegel masters. And uh, but, well, it's, uh, it's moving. And the, the average skill in data science is rising, which I think is a good thing. And that's the idea of bringing, uh, having open source communities, open-minded stuff. So I like it. But of course, it makes it harder to, to stay at the top, So because um, the competition gets tougher. 
Can driverless AI handle non-IID IID data, i.e. time series? Yeah, so uh, that's a um, uh, recent new feature that we actually can handle time series data and we can also detect them automatically. So if the user isn't sure if you have temporal elements in it, uh, we can spot it, which is actually pretty nice to have, I think. So Because sometimes it's not obvious. So, uh, I mean, if you have like... Uh, a date column or so, it's obvious that you have temporal structure, but sometimes in a data set it's really hidden. And if you then do like normal random cross validation, you get pretty good results, and then you put that into production and you see, oh my goodness, what's happening? It doesn't work. So, and um, that's what we try to accomplish with, with driverless AI, that we actually uh, take care about all those pitfalls and uh, avoid them, and helps the, helps the user to, uh, to bring a really good and also a valid model into, into the production. Great. Um, no more incoming questions. I, I, have a, I have a question, and maybe you, you said it and I missed it. So in your first diagram, when you showed kind of your, your block diagram of the process that you took for home site, yeah. um, how did you go about... Um, oh, no, we, we can get the slides back up, actually, if we want. Um, but how did you go from your 500 models to your 150 models in the first model selection step? And, and how did you kind of select those numbers? Um, so the, the, I think the first step, you made like 500 yeah, models. We, uh, I, so the first point is we, we rounded the numbers a bit. It was not exactly 500 and 125. I think it was like maybe 127 or something. Um, does it work? So here, yeah. So actually uh, what we did here, um, first we collect, uh, we really built just really a lot of models on different input data, uh, subsets of data, different kind of features, really diverse models, like around 500. And then in a Kaggle competition, we always, of course, we try to optimize our metrics. So that's what we care about. So that is what I mentioned before. So in a Kaggle competition, you want to get a model which performs best on unseen data. So if you see, we see a cross-validation score just as a number. It's not actually, we know it's not the true risk estimation. It's, it's really biased, but as long as we know if we get a better local validation, our final outcome will be better, we are fine. In Kaggle, we are fine, but if you want to say, okay, um, really have a really uh, solid estimation of uh, what the error will look like in your production, then it's a different story. Then you have to at least say, we, we let the leakage in in our meta modeling here because we know our bias we get um, we, we don't need to care about as long as we are certain um, that our final model is really better. So, but if i really interested in the concrete number, um, I have to do, I, have, I know um, that I have leakage in it and, that, uh, and I know that my estimation is biased and I need to care about it and need to fix it. So that depends. And so small selections are really based on cross-validation, so you drop some uh, models. Um, here we use uh, a technique called noise injection. So what you do is you, you have your meta model and you inject, uh, inject noise to it. And if you noisify uh, uh, your predictions and your, your results get actually better, then you drop it. If your results get worse, you keep it and something like that. So and you do it in a repeated manner and um, then you get finally to your final ensemble. And but basically, in stacking, you, you do where you go, um, so um, the shallower it gets. So in the third level, where we just do an average, there you can't use a Nixie boost model any longer. It just uh, brings no advantage. It's not because there's no more information left to actually do some, to find some nonlinear relationship. So you just do a linear blend, and you get some tiny improvement. I mean, but... I mean, that's, that's part of Kaggle, right? You, you fight for the fifth significant digit, but it could mean <laughs> 10 places. So that is why you go for it. Um, but you wouldn't probably do that in, uh, in production. All right, let's give Matthias another hand. Thank you.